Thank you very much, Linda, for this kind introduction and for the invitation. And first of all, I need to apologize because I'm going to sit down immediately. I'm recovering from a rather painful back surgery, and so I better don't risk it. Thank you for understanding. It's a great pleasure to be back to Prague and to talk about sustainable finance. But before I do that, let me say a few words about myself and why I'm so moved by this situation. Uh, I became, for the first time, European Affairs Minister of my country in 1994, having just uh, begun to digest German unification and the overcoming of the division of Europe. And at that time, we negotiated, or began to negotiate, the preparation of the Central European countries for membership in the European Union. I would not, never have imagined that by the year 2023, we would sit at such a high level, but also future-oriented, innovation-oriented conference here in Prague, uh, bringing together people from all over Central Europe and, and beyond. So congratulations on that enormous achievement here. And um, at the same time, I was remembered uh, when I took that uh, cabinet job for the first time in 1994 that I was asked what in European integration means for me. And I said European integration is the tool of the European Union, member states, how to organize their survival in the globalization process. Now, globalization is not so much popular anymore because we are more afraid of fragmentation in this world. But first of all, we see, and this is why the sentence is still true, the shift of the balance of powers in this world is enormous. And uh, at that time, I think um, I have the figures rather correctly, the member states of the European Economic Community at that time produced something like 37% of the world's GDP. This is down to 13% now. So we have to make sure that we don't miss our interest in the world. And this is why it's crystal clear that in 2023, it's even more true than in 1953 when Jean Monnet said, uh, let's be honest, our countries have, to, have become too small for this world. We need to do it together. Now, I'm delighted to be here today and kick off the discussion on sustainability in finance, sustainability in finance, and that's pretty much in the DNA of EIB. EIB has been the EU's climate bank already for a long time, not only because we are the world's, one of the world's largest climate financiers, but also we are the pioneers in green bond issuances. And that is uh, quite remarkable because in 2007, when my colleagues from the bank invented green bonds, and I think uh, some of the inventors will be present here during this conference, Ayla Krevi in particular, uh, she is the mother of green bonds and sustainability bonds. When she and her colleagues came to the market with this project of, of sustainability bonds or green bonds, whatever we would call them, that was considered to totally lunatic idea. Can't work. You're going to hit the wrong targets. And nowadays, uh, you know what kind of volume we are talking about. So uh, we have been associated with this issue for decades. This winter, uh, the European Union has weathered a historic energy crisis. And let's not fool ourselves, we have been lucky because the weather conditions were not as critical as they could have been with much more even adverse uh, effects on the, for the um, energy supply of our people and our companies. The European Union is putting an end to a massive dependency on Russian fossil fuels. And we are doing it all without derailing the Green Deal. This, this is very important uh, because uh, oh, I'm, I was present yesterday in my capacity as member of the committee of the Prix Charlemagne, the most prestigious award that is being offered once a year to a political leader or a country. And this, yesterday in Aachen, it was awarded to President Zelensky and the Ukrainian people. 
it is really quite remarkable that we have managed not to get the energetic transformation and the green transformation derailed during the process of dealing with the Ukraine crisis. And I even go one thing beyond it, one step beyond it, and uh, maybe you think, what does this have to do with this conference? But if we say we are living in this world, then I'm not only talking about industrialized countries and the relationship with the United States of America and Japan and China, Korea and others. We're talking also about the countries of the so-called Global South. The countries of the so-called Global South, they have the suspicion that the more we deal with Ukraine and getting our act together in the European Union, the less we'll take care of the needs of the developing world. The facts and figures speak a different language. We have managed to be outgoing and active in the developing world at the same time when we address the climate crisis and the agenda and transformation. And this is important because if we want to have the countries of the so-called third world also going with us with the next decision in the General Assembly of the United Nations when it comes to Ukraine, for instance, then we better take care of them and put them into a, a context and not allow ourselves a dreaming, for instance, of green hydrogen, about green hydrogen, meaning that we bring the production for high advanced electricity production capacity to Africa and Latin America with the geothermal installations with much more solar energy, in particular with wind farms, floating wind farms. And then we are capable of the electrolysis production for the production of green hydrogen. Then we put the green hydrogen on pipes or boats, bring it to Europe, and the further industrial production takes place in Europe. This is not the way the world will work in the next year, decades, in the next century. And uh, the president of the African Union, Maki Sall, whom uh, I know quite well because we cooperated particularly with him, the president of Senegal, when we, uh, we found, uh, or we helped a company finding the first real successful vaccine, BioNTech slash Pfizer. Pfizer is the marketeer, marketer of the whole thing, not the owner of the intellectual property. And um, this is something that we must be able to perform also in the future vis-a-vis -vis the countries of the South, because Maki Salt asked me, you know, when you use our green hydrogen, instead of allowing us to tap our natural gas sources, because that is not green enough, then you do the same thing you have done 200 years ago. You're just exploiting this time the production possibilities of green hydrogen in Africa and the industrial production uh, and the benefit goes to the citizen in, the, in America and Europe and elsewhere. So what's in it for us? So please, ladies and gentlemen, when we address these wonderful issues of sustainable finance that you have put on the agenda, think global because otherwise we are going to uh, miss our opportunities and responsibilities in this world. So uh, we turn the energy crisis into a green energy sprint. The member states of the European Union are adopting new targets and measures to accelerate energy efficiency in investment, deployment of renewables, and the expansion of our power networks. Our most recent climate investment research at EIB showed that more and more firms are engaging in climate action. Over the last year, the share of European firms investing in the climate has increased by 10%, reaching 53% on average. And the increase has been particularly pronounced in Central and Eastern Europe. What we have achieved over the last year, triggered by the Russian war in Ukraine and following the European Commission's Repower EU plan, has been unprecedented. And we'll see more to come, that, that's for sure. We at the European Investment Bank have, stopped, have stepped up our ambition and activities and stand ready to provide extraordinary support to the European Commission's Repower EU plan. The IB Group has always adopted first measures to address the growing gap in green infrastructure. In October last year, 
we committed an additional 30 billion euros to accelerate investment in clean energies, and this comes on top of what uh, we would lend to the sector every year anyway. Last year alone, alone uh, we have invested a record 19 billion euro in clean energies worldwide. 19 billion. And I am happy to say that our support to the energy sector of the Czech Republic has reached nearly 1 billion euro. The majority of this financing is in support of the reinforcement and refurbishment of the Czech electricity network. Even though there are promising sign signals when it comes to the decarbonization of our economies, it's not enough. The evidence about the climate crisis becomes more alarming by the day, and the decisions we make, investments we support in all parts of Europe and the world support the transition to a carbon-free, energy-independent future. In other words, these have to be sustainable investments. We need to prioritize green energy, clean transport, energy efficiency while reducing carbon emissions and strengthening Europe's resilience and ability to fight future crises. Investment in climate action is not only a necessity in the fight against climate change, but it's also a great business opportunity. And I cannot emphasize this enough, because if you look around this world and see where has Europe arrived at after the last four or five decades of global competition, when at the beginning we were, had been ahead of the others in most areas. Nowadays, it's in particular green technologies where the Europeans still have an edge. And I emphasize, still, we better speed up in order not to lose that edge as well. The net zero economy will grow exponentially over the coming decade. By 2030, it will have reached 600 billion euro annually, according to the International Energy Agency. And this is an enormous chance for the EU. We need to grab it. So instead of dwelling on doomsday scenarios from morning to night, we should rather adopt somewhat more of a can-do approach. Yes, we can solve that. If we systematically link climate, innovation, and development. This is also a very timely chance for all, also for the Central, European, Central Eastern European countries, where the sustainable green and digital transition may trigger yet another level of motion. So we at the EIB have the tools to make such investments happen. We provide loans and financing instruments and offer many billions of euros each year in patient long-term financing that makes risky projects more palatable for private investors. By the way, if these were not risky things, then there would not need be the need or justification for the intervention of a public institution like a bank that is owned by 27 member states of the European Union. We must address market failures, not areas where Erste or uh, Deutsche or whoever can do the job alone. Speaking about the Czech market, we have recently invested for the second time into Invent Capital, the uh, clean tech fund investing across the region to support even more digital success stories. We are launching a new fund of funds to boost digital and AI investments in the country via our subsidiary, the European Investment Fund, and in close collaboration with the Czech Ministry of Trade and Industry. And I think our colleagues from EIF will be here this week as well. In the past, our finance products led to major breakthroughs. I've already mentioned BioNTech uh, for the vaccines. We finance 40% of Europe's offshore wind capacity, and we are supporting the first European battery gigafactories. So, ladies and gentlemen, we need a new green pan-European investment initiative. And that needs to include, and now the pessimist in me comes up, better regulation, global partnerships, and targeted financial support. And again, please, let's adopt a can-do approach. Yes, we can master that. The European Union's Commission's Green Deal industrial plan is the first step in this direction. Most importantly, the financial pillar of such an initiative must be sustainable, sufficiently diverse, offering both long-term patient financing to massively roll out financing of green energy, as well as support for SMEs, innovative SMEs in particular, and mid-caps through venture capital 
and private equity to incentivize companies to develop and scale up new cutting-edge clean tech technologies in Europe. Yes, we are in some countries of the European Union quite good in helping startups, but we are pretty bad at helping scale-ups because when these companies turn out to be successful with their small new developments, then all of a sudden they are becoming interesting for non-European uh, superpowers, and then they are gone. We need to help these companies to scale up in Europe and stay here. The EIB is committed to enabling the EU to lead the next wave of breakthrough innovation. Our goal is to drive new technologies that solve the challenges of our time and help Europe's innovators to become global technology leaders. So let me conclude, ladies and gentlemen, by saying that sustainable investments remain crucial for growth, and they're also key enablers to making the green transition possible. You can count on EIB's support to make this happen. Thank you for your attention, and as you have a very interesting week ahead of you, and the lineup of speakers is impressive, I wish you all fruitful discussions. Thank you very much for your patience with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much for the inspirational Thank and very you. positive forward-looking um, remarks as well. And now we'll move to the second keynote of this block. Um, Mr. Gabriel Maroshi, the okay. Chief Sustainability Officer of Erste Group. The floor is yours, please. Julian, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation as well. Um, I, am, uh, I am very much pleased and honored to be here today, and uh, this is my very personal excitement uh, that we have these discussions for, for a couple of reasons, but uh, before I would just you know, go into that, uh, let me also thank to the organizers, uh, Linda, Julian, you are doing a great job. We can see already on, on this couple of first discussions that uh, the event is addressing the right issues in the right spirit. So I, I wish that it is continuing then in the remaining days as well. Um, now, still let me come back for a moment uh, for, for my personal excitement, why I'm, I'm so happy that we have these discussions here. And I was, I was also very much listening what uh, Linda said at the, at the introduction. Um, it is very important to know that we are not alone. Yeah? Um, and, and in this sense, uh, we as bankers, we are very kind of proficient, you know, to speak about liquidity, capital allocation, profitability, margins here and margins there. But these discussions which started now and, and, and uh, today is a remarkable day as again, in, in that sense, uh, discussing sustainable finance and sustainability is about the future. So sustainability finance is financing the future. Uh, is, is, is really something uh, which is giving uh, a further mandate to the banking, I do believe, also in the future. And just that you also see that, uh, you know, these discussions are not led only in these kind of salts and, and, and rooms. Um, I, I, I'm just coming last week, we were in, in Croatia within, within, the, uh, within the commercial real estate community of Erste Group, 150 bankers were discussing where we need to arrive in 2025, 2030, 2035. We already have had the picture on our portfolio, which are the assets which are currently fitting to the future standards, and which are those assets which are not fitting eventually, which are already foreseeable, can be treated in intensive care because they might become strangled assets. And you know the questions, what I received is uh, how we can do it. And the answer is here today in this room. Uh, we can do it because we are not alone in this game. And I will come to that, but uh, let's, uh, let's move also to the topic of the discussion about ESG data and, uh, and the ESG ratings. Um, I need to say, I, I think that I prepared some slides. The green is the boom or? OK, good. Um, so. Before I would show you some of my thoughts, um, also I, I wanted to lay down the ground that I, I do believe that uh, sustainability is a systemic shift. It's a behavioral change in the economy, it's a behavioral change, necessary change in the society. But to make this change, we need 
simple currencies, because we know that the currency, and not just the monetary value, but currency is something which is moving ahead the things. So we need to have such a currencies which are simple, which are also low-cost transactions, and which are also sufficiently common currencies, right? I do believe that we have seen this discussion in the, in the morning panel already, which is addressing this issue. But the, 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 the theme of, of, of currencies, I, I would like to somehow promote further in, in, in this presentation. Um, I also would like to pay a tribute to Mr. Spoltz and the, and the DG for the financial stability and the financial markets, because you are doing a, a great job. Because, to be honest, when uh, the Commission announced in 2018 and then 19 the Green Deal, previously the Sustainable Finance Ac Action Plan, um, it was very hard to foresee how this can be you know, brought into motion. How, what we will see in two years' time, three years' time, and how the market will be able to digest all of these changes. And what we see today, uh, that out of the 10 points of the Sustainable Finance uh, Action Plan, Many of the things are now getting very concrete and already an implementation, concrete shape and implementation phase. We discussed the EU taxonomy, we also touched SFDR. We are just heading you know, to the last uh, preparations on the CSRD and uh, we have big projects on that, how to implement all the requirements concerning connected to this reporting obligation. And I very much hope and wish that also we will see the CSDD, the due diligence directive coming to light as well, because all of this is helping us to, you know, put up the gears and make the train move. Um, but we also should see that all of these uh, uh, regulations, all of this legislation is relying heavily on the ESG related data. So the capability of the market to generate this data, to originate this data, to report on the data, and also to integrate the data into the processes will be a decisive success factor where we are going to arrive in the next two years or the next five years. And just you know, to bring you a little bit of, of the light, we see already that uh, the asset managers are now in the final stage of disclosure of the principal in adverse impact assessment. So we will, have, uh, we will have very interesting data coming in. Uh, the companies are actually this year already disclosing their taxonomy alignment. And just by any coincidence, a couple of weeks ago, UMV, you know, very prominent company in this region, disclosed their sustainability report. And I need to here complement again what has been said. There, you will find their 0.1% ratio of the turnover alignment but you will find their 9.5% ratio of the capex. So the future you know, investments and the future investments, I do believe, will translate into the future turnover as well. So we see that the market is moving, and of course, the banks are not exception out of that. Uh, the banks already disclosed the first round of taxonomy reports for the 2022 year. We are now looking very carefully and started to collect the data for the this year taxonomy disclosure. But of course, uh, we are also uh, disclosing in a in couple of weeks. I do believe we will see it from the majority of the banks, the pillar three disclosures, providing a huge set of already valuable data, be it on the side of the, of, of the, of the portfolio structures, which are aligned to, to the future environmental objectives, be it on the side of the EPC labels of, of our collaterals, which is mostly real estate, and also partially already the exposures to over, you know, the uh, high emission sectors. And next year, additional information is going to come. So all the market participants, be it, you know, asset managers, be it companies, be it uh, the financial institutions, are now moving with their reports. And I would just like to encourage you that you are taking very careful look into, into these appearing figures because this is showing then the impact. Now, um, let me come then to the, to the field of my expertise. As a banker, of course, I like to speak about banking. Um, so what are the challenges with, with what, what the banks are facing? And uh, of course, we have each quarter, you know, the presentation of the results. So we have, you know, the pressure from our investors. But beside of that, the second most important party for us are the regulators. 
And I need to say that ECB is, uh, is, 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 is putting a quite high attention and scrutiny on the banking sector, how the banking sector is implementing the climate and environmental, uh, uh, environmental risks, uh, risk management. And on that front, uh, uh, I, I just you know, looked at as well into the report what uh, I just forget to share with you my thoughts also in writing. So the currencies we have seen, uh, the action plan we have seen, and uh, now let me come uh, to the challenges of the banks. Um, so uh, coming, back, uh, coming back still for one thought on, on, on the regulatory front, uh, we have seen last year in November ECB disclosed the first round of you know, observations from the thematic reviews on the climate and uh, env environmental related risks. And I need to say that the conclusion coming out that 55% of the banks are already progressing relatively well on the implementation of, of these standards, and approximately 10% of the banks are trying to ignore the reality. Now, this 10%, if I understood right, the report already received additional capital requirements. So I, I do believe that the banking sector is moving ahead very strongly. In the first phase, we implemented questionnaires to our customers, uh, where especially to the large uh, corporate customers, uh, to, to start you know, the data collection and also to have a basis for our forward-looking assessment, what is ahead of the banks concerning the climate impacts and, uh, and the impacts through the economy. And you can see that challenge is not just to collect the data, but to translate the data in a horizon of the next 5, 10, and in the stress test, even, uh, even 30 years horizon. So we have a very big demand and also very big reliance on the data and the data quality which is coming in. Now, we should not forget that the data is not coming just by coincidence. The data is coming from our customers. And therefore, it's very, very important to understand what are the customers for the banks in the Central and Eastern European region. And we need to see that uh, we are part of the supply chains, largely. These economies are part of the supply chains of the large international companies. Therefore, it's not surprising that most of the balance sheets of the banks are loaded with SME exposures, but also on the other side with, uh, with real estate-related exposures, especially you know, housing loans. Now, you might ask, Good. then what is the common with all the regulatory framework, all the legislation which is coming, which is addressing you know, the large companies, typically having uh, you know, 500 and more employees and having a relatively high turnover threshold. SMEs are not meeting that. Households are not meeting that. Uh, so the challenge of, of the banks in this region is collect data from economic players who are primarily not necessarily subject of the obligations. Point number one. Point number two, uh, these economic players typically also do not have uh, not just the motivation, but also the means to build up awareness, build up knowledge, and to produce this level and, and this quality of, of data what we need. So um, coming to the banks of this region, I do believe that in the coming years, we still will need to invest a lot to awareness raising of our customers and creating mostly a kind of, as I mentioned, this single currencies, what the broader society can accept, can understand, and can translate. Now, in this sense, I would like to point out uh, two currencies, what I do believe will be decisive in the future. First is definitely the greenhouse gas emissions. The greenhouse gas emissions are resulting to the climate change, and therefore they are the primary target for us to manage and to, and, and to reduce them. And you should, we should ask as well, uh, do we have standards which are clear and intuitive enough in the greenhouse gas emissions, what a typical SME can implement without substantial consultancy cost? Do we provide sufficient support for the SMEs for this very simple and elementary measure like the greenhouse gas emissions? 
And I need to say that uh, coming back from our surveys and the interaction with SME customers, we see here a big gap. So this is what I do believe that one of the essential points, what we need to close to move the sea region into the direction of reducing emissions effectively and having a societal support. Now, I do believe also that it can be done. It can be done through digitalization. This is what, into what we, are, uh, what we are investing as well. And I do believe that the digitalization can bring this topic also close to the households, that they do understand what are the emissions behind their housing, behind their mobility, and behind their daily, daily being um, as such. Let me also very briefly just mention a couple of very good examples, what I so much appreciate because they helped us very much to, to implement all these measures leading us in the, in the, in the, in the trajectory of uh, toward net zero emissions in Aztec Group. Firstly, um, I, 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 I need to say that I appreciate very much the, uh, the, the PICAF initiative, Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials. This is a great and a revolutionary thing what 14 banks, Dutch banks, did in 2015, starting to develop an open source standard. They gave it available to everybody. And I need to say that the methodology is very simple and intuitive. You can implement it without substantial investment costs. It provides you a certain level of accuracy. And mostly, the methodology comes also with the emission factor database. So you have everything in place to plug in based on your portfolio structure, the calculations, and receive you know, the calculation results. Of course, you can invest more. You can collect exact data, and you can plug in also the exact company data. I do believe that you know, this model shows that the sector, the financial sector, is investing into building up the new concept. And we were happy to join to that. I also need to mention uh, the second, my favorite, CDP, uh, the Carbon Disclosure Project. Uh, in our endeavor in, in Erste Group, when we implemented a whole set of, uh, you know, the, the inventory of our emissions, and some of my colleagues are sitting here who were coping with this issue, we were just, you know, facing many times uncertainties. How to interpret the methodology, but mostly do we fit into a kind of market consensus, a market standard? And CDP is, although it's, it's quite demanding, you know, to fill out all the questionnaires, but it provides, again, something very valuable. It provides you the possibility of a detailed benchmarking. Benchmarking yourself, benchmarking the market, and see also where the whole industry is developing. So I do believe that in the future, in the coming discussions, we will have here also people from, uh, from uh, CDP initiative. So, um, I, I do believe that this is, to, this is something that is going to be taken forward. And then let me just in the remaining zero minutes um, come to very few thoughts on the ESG ratings, because this is, this is also a topic uh, dedicated to the ESG ratings. Um, and I need to say, I am a believer of the ESG ratings. We are, as bankers, we are making daily decisions based on ratings. As the group, as such, in this region is allocating yearly 40 billion euros new money. All of these decisions are taken based on ratings. We cannot do sustainable decisions, sustainability-related decisions, without ESG ratings. Now, uh, the second part, also why I do believe in the ESG ratings, is that we have seen that these rating agencies have a very enhanced data collection capabilities. And I, again, do believe that this will be necessary for the transition to build up sound and reliable and available databases. Now, let me also just quote a couple of uh, points where the ESG ratings are still, you know, have what to do. Yeah? Um, so, firstly, what we see is that the ESG rating universe has at this moment a very small overlap with the CE region. What we have seen is that this is approximately 5 and definitely not then 10 percent. This is not enough. We need much more focus on the CE region. And, of course, this is connected, you know, to the availability of the information. But I do believe that there is a way. Secondly, we have also seen that, uh, 
you know, this kind of unsolicited approach what the ESG rating agencies are following today leads to a very high volatility of the rating assessments. I do believe that that is something, into, again, uh, we, we need to invest. And the third part, where we also do see that, uh, you know, the very different approaches of the ESG rating agencies are resulting into a very different assessment. Typically, in Erste Group, we are applying three or more ESG ratings together to have a kind of holistic and comprehensive assessment. But those who work with uh, ratings, scorecards, etc., knows that the more information you are combining together, the more noise you are getting into the system and you are losing the accuracy. So, you know, combination of the ESG ratings is not a solution, not a long-term solution. So, I, 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 I am very much, uh, I am conf very much confident that uh, most of you are facing very similar issues, so I will not go into that. Uh, let me just then close um, my thoughts that um, I do believe that the ESG data is a challenge, but also an opportunity. And the opportunity, as I men mentioned, uh, this is coming mostly through the establishing currencies, which are understood by the economic player, by the society. And that can bring us, you know, uh, forward uh, with, a, with a much more, with a much bigger confidence and with a much bigger impact as well. So thank you very much uh, for the patience and thank you very much again for the organization, organization uh, providing us this chance. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Gabriel, uh, for really solutions-oriented oriented and forward-looking uh, contribution as well. Thank you once again to Mr. President Hoyer. And now, thank you for opening the, the topic of the next, the next discussion, too. So now we are moving to the panel discussion of the second block. And I will very kindly welcome the speakers and the moderator to, to the stage. So maybe if you can start with the moderator. Lucy, if you can please uh, join us here, so that Lucy Fitzgeorge Parker from the Responsible Investor. And then I think we can continue from this side. So Elena Filippoa from uh, London Stock Exchange. And uh, we have Julian Mazzucarati, Senior Economist from ESMA. Philip A.B. from Reprisk, please. And Katarzyna Bohuslava from the Chess Group. Please welcome to the stage. And also Hakan Lucius from the EIB. Please come to the stage. And I will, I will Lucy, introduce you even in more detail. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Julian, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this conference. It, it's great to be here. Uh, as it says on the board, my name is Lucy Fitzgeorge Parker. I'm the editor at Responsible Investor. We're a London-based publication. We're one of the oldest publications in the sustainable finance, and we're the main international media partner for this conference, um, which I was very keen to be part of because before I moved to covering sustainable finance, I covered CE for 12 years. Uh, it's a region that I know well and um, very pleased to see how much has been happening in sustainability here in the past uh, couple of years. But on to the discussion for today. Uh, uh, ESG ratings. Well, we have already heard quite a bit about ESG ratings from several people. We've heard that there is quite a lot of criticism of ESG ratings. We've had a relatively rare vote of, of support for ESG ratings from Gabrielle just now, which is, which is great. But still, obviously, some suggestions on how they could be improved. Um, before we get started on the discussion, I'll just ask every, everyone on the panel to introduce themselves very briefly. Hakan, do you want to, would you like to start? Well, thank you, Lucy. Um, I'm Hakan, Hakan Dutsios. I'm Head of Corporate Responsibility at the European Investment Bank. And thank you very much for the organizers for this great opportunity. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Katarina Bohuslova, and I'm Chief Sustainability Officer at Chess Group. And we're happy to sponsor this event. Good morning, Philip. Philip Baby. I'm the CEO of Reprisk, uh, ESG data provider. Mm -hmm. Good morning. I'm Julian. I'm a senior economist at ESMA. Um, this is not a household name, so ESMA is the pan-European regulator of financial markets, um, and we closely collaborate with the European Commission uh, and national competent authorities also. 
Hi everyone, Elena Filipova. I am the global head of ESG solutions at LSEC. Um, and under that family, um, we have Refinity, FTSE Russell, Beyond Ratings, to name a few. And we are um, ESG data analytics and index provider house. Um, and congratulations to the organizers for an excellent summit. Great. Well, we have a very good range of perspectives here to discuss ESG ratings. Now, as I say, there has been a lot of criticism. The criticism has ranged from, I think, perhaps what we'd all agree are some, some valid concerns about maybe transparency, um, conflict of interest, I know, has been something ESMA has been concerned about in the past, um, uh, uh, correlation even to, and um, we had uh, some talk about the US uh, anti-ESG movement this morning, and yeah, ESG ratings are uh, apparently woke, according to um, the, the US, US politicians. Um, but what we haven't actually heard yet is a, uh, a perspective from, from a corporate. I mean, obviously, um, Katerina, you're on the, the, the other end. We're, we're mostly talking about this, about how people use uh, ESG ratings, but you're on the other end of the, uh, of, of the um, spectrum, as it were, uh, in that you, you are the ones who have to provide, or you, you get rated, uh, and you have to provide the information for ESG ratings. Now, I know that um, CHES has been, um, has, has done very well on the sustainability reporting, has been, has been won awards for that. Um, well, what are your, what, how, does, how does it look from, from your perspective? What are the sort of pluses and minuses of, of the process for you? Well, actually, I could sum it up in one word, and that's frustration. <laughs> Um, but l let me perhaps give you a little bit of context, because sustainability reporting at CHES rests on four legs. Imagine a desk with four legs, and the first one clearly is legislation. We are compliant with legislation. Um, but then there are also reporting standards, and although they're not mandatory, we are reporting according to them, because we believe that they're standards for a reason, and they provide clarity. And then, of course, because we're a publicly traded company, we do get rated by ESG uh, agencies. Um, and it started by unsolicited ratings. So there are agencies that we don't even know rate us because we don't communicate with every single agency there is. Um, and then the fourth leg actually is competition, our peers in the market. And why is that important? Because some ESG ratings are not objective in the sense that they um, rate your performance. They also have a relative element when they compare you with your peers. And that would be fine if we were comparing comparable things. But you do have um, geographical differences that physically constrain what you can do, and that's true for energy sector in particular. You also have different legislative landscapes. Um, if something is mandatory in Western countries, it's much easier for our competitors to achieve, where when I'm dealing with it in the Czech Republic and I'm talking to my suppliers, for example, all I can say is, pretty please. So that makes it more difficult. And the fact that we don't understand methodologies, that they're conflicting, that ESG uh, rating agencies measure different things, um, that the methodology changes over time, that if you do want to get white glove service, sometimes you have to pay. Um, now, let me be clear, I'm not saying that we pay to get better rating. That is not possible, that is not the case. But with getting better service, with understanding the map better, it's much easier to achieve your goal. So, um, and then I mentioned competition. If our goal or Chess Group's goal is to be among the top 20 best rated companies, and I look at my competitors and I see one company in the 80th percentile with one agency and in the 20th percentile with another agency, how does that make sense? So we're very data oriented. We believe in data because we believe that data based, evidence based decisions are best. But the data must be good. The quality of the data should not be compromised. And we should be able to understand that. And I think that's not the case. And then there is a second aspect, and that's communication, because a lot of information gets lost in translation. 
And I mean that literally, translating from Czech to English, which has been tough, but then also in communicating the right things. We need to make sure that our reports are AI readable. We need to make sure that English speakers, both native and non-native, find the information, that we use the right keywords, and that we include things that in this region at this age are um, taken for granted. For example, we did not declare that we don't employ children. Um, and that were against child labor because it was something like, why would you declare that? that? That's a given. But you have to because ESG ratings are global and we need to think globally. And I think it's been said, we need to compare ourselves to a large set of our competitors and make sure that we communicate everything because not providing information is also information. Okay, great. Well, Philip, um, as, a, as, as a ratings provider, as a, um, that's, there's quite a lot of things that have been brought up in terms of some of the issues with the sector. Uh, maybe, well, I'll let, you, I'll let you decide where you want to start with addressing some of them, um, whether, it, whether it's transparency, whether it's the question of sort of uh, different jurisdictions. Um, what, what, what are you hearing, sort of uh, uh, the key issues with ratings, and do they match what Katerina has been, has been expressing? So let me start with the key issues, and, and then maybe we talk also about repris, how, how we uh, deal with that. But um, Gabriel, so you said you use CM because there's no other way that you basically can deliver in terms of allocation, etc. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's the only way you can basically deliver the products or the, or the, the portfolio construction, etc. Um, and, and this goes back to this... Um, convenience argument in a way, and, and I, I really would like to challenge um, practitioners and say, why do you use something that, that have really very serious issues? And, and uh, I made a very personal, Gabriel, I'm sorry, but, uh, <laughs> but um, what, what are the issues that I see as, as, as the most severe ones? And I think they, I see four of them. Let me see if I can remember four things. The first of all is, um, the argument that there's a diversity of opinion, right? Like, like a cell site research, you know, is, is, is that fairly valued this company or not? This argument, in my view, is not valid at all, because if you, if you look at the most downloaded scientific paper, this aggregate confusion paper that looks actually in the mechanism how these uh, ratings are, are done, then you see the three elements that determine the outcome. First of all, what measurement points do you look at, how to measure them. For example, do you look at um, uh, employee safety? And then basically, do you take then the number of fatalities or you take the number of uh, incidents re related to, to, to safety? And then the third element, how you aggregate that. And, and this leads to these deviations. And, and the problem is there's so many little decisions on, on, on the weights, on, 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 uh, on, on the data that are available. Even so, there are a lot of experts taking these decisions. At the end of the day, it's pretty random what, what, uh, what comes out of that. So this non-correlation of these ESG ratings is not because there's a diversity of opinion, no, because, because it's so many random little decisions that have to be taken. And just to be very clear, these are experts that take this, these decisions, but if you, if you aggregate everything, then you have this aggregate confusion. And this is, when I did my PhD a long time ago, I had to do something which, which you call in science uh, error propagation. You have to understand why do you get a certain, a certain result. So the first thing that, that, that uh, some people say, that you have a diversity of opinion reflecting ratings, that's not true, because these non-correlations are a pr pretty uh, random uh, phenomena. And I know that things are improving, but that's basically the, the situation um, still valid if you read this aggregate confusion paper. The, the second thing, um, I should not talk about uh, other companies, but I do it nevertheless because I'm missionary and I want to get that out. If you look at the consultation paper in, in the UK about um, whether they want to regulate ESG rating agencies, they say something very, very important. They say this market, as much um, um, providers they are actually out, is dominated by one player. And that's especially true for Europe. It's a bit less true for, uh, um, uh, for America, where fortunately we have uh, uh, FTSE Russell and, and, and S&P in addition. But it's true for Europe. So it's basically one provider. 
And this one provider, basically, then based on that, their ETFs, indices, etc., and then basically in the retail market, people basically buy a sustainability ETF fund, and then this one provider tells the people, sorry, guys, this is not about um, improving the, uh, the situation for, for people on planet. These ETFs, based on our ESG ratings, are all about that these companies manage their own uh, financial um, exposure well. So it has nothing to do with what most people believe. So second fact is it's one dominant player. And if you then, third fact, if you then read the, the, the article of Bloomberg that I think is the best article ever written on ESG ratings called ESG Mirage. I ur urge you to, to read that. Then actually you see that when a company improves in, in, in the ESG rating, it's not necessarily, and in this case not at all, um, because the company has done everything great, Maybe they forgot actually to say they don't employ children. Um, no, it's, it's because the methodology changed. Mm -hmm. Seriously, this is East Chi Mirage. It's, it's a Bloomberg article. I have no clue why Bloomberg wrote the article because I really rent against uh, two big uh, players in, in the US market. But read this paper. Uh, this is article, this journalistic work, um, the, uh, the East Chi uh, Mirage. And then the fourth one, um, another fact to be known is it's not only methodology changes, but it's also backfilling of data. There's only one provider that, that, um, uh, of the ESG rating agencies that has been so transparent because they worked so much with the academia that this is actually known. Otherwise, if, if you ask any of the ESG rating providers apart from us, we give the data to you, have you changed, have you backfilled data? They don't, we won't give you this information, but there's one provider that historically has, has provided this, this data to many academics, so you see all this time series, and you see there's an incredible amount of, 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 of backfilling going on. And that's even one of the better providers. So, so these four things make me really wonder, is this convenience argument, is it a good argument, or should we actually take a step back and say, you know what, sustainability is too big a thing. Let's focus on something smaller, for example, um, just on carbon or on diversity, this clear purpose. So I think to use ESG ratings right is a big, big challenge everyone should be aware of, including the supervisors. Okay, great. Uh, well, I forgot to, just, just before we go on, I forgot to mention earlier, uh, I'm sure you all know that the, if you'd like to ask any questions, we have Slido, and you'll see the uh, hashtag to use up there on the board, hashtag CE Summit 2023. Um, and also, I was all going to mention the, uh, if you're not aware of it, I think the paper Philip was mentioning, aggregate um, confusion is the MIT study from 2019, I think, or a bit earlier. Well, 2019 was the first time published, but now actually it got officially peer-reviewed yeah. published this year. Right, uh, because it, and that uh, showed that the correlation between ESG ratings is uh, 0.61 versus, uh, I think, 0.99 or something for, for credit ratings. But obviously, as Philip has been explaining, clearly there are some very good reasons for that. Um, but maybe uh, moving on to Elena. Uh, yeah, again, there's a, a lot, a lot going on here. Um, what part of the what part of the debate do you think is is sort of most relevant? Looking looking ahead, um, sort of given where we've come from with the ESG ratings. You know, sort of how is this? How, how do we, how do we go forward from here? Um, thank you, Lucien. Uh, of course, a lot of great topics already touched on. Um, I think it's important maybe to reflect on, on the evolution in the space and what are some of the key drivers and teams. And maybe I'll start with the good news and then move into the bad news and then talk about what that means for the future. The good news is that we've seen a lot more adoption and usage of, of ESG scores and ratings. And I'll make that distinction and maybe elaborate in a minute why. Um, happening across regions in capital markets. Uh, Gabriel spoke about it, but that's not a unique phenomena. Uh, that is the um, direction of travel that we see across all regions. Um, ESG ratings are used to shift capital, and that's putting a lot of pressure on, co on companies and corporates of all sizes and geographies to continue receiving access to capital. They need to be transparent and provide information to then inform one of the new emerging criteria when making and, and make, making investment decisions. So adoption is, is a key trend and it's a key driver and we need to make sure that um, the credibility and trust in that data set 
is built forward rather than deteriorated. And there's been a talk about trust erosion in ESG data and scores. So I think that that's one of the reasons why it's important to rethink what ESG ratings are and what they're not, and be very transparent and clear when communicating with consumers. The second um, theme is, is around transparency. We've spoken about transparency um, already a few times today, and I bet you this will continue to be a central topic in all panels in the course of, of this summit this week. Um, from a data provider perspective, we've also seen more and more data providers opening up their processes and opening up their models to inform users and guide them in terms of what they can and expect to, to see and what they can expect not to see when consuming the information. What are the design principles? If the data has been um, uh, quant analyzed, meaning it's a score that is based on an algorithm, and an algorithm can be replicated and customized to meet the needs of users, that's something from our perspective we see very powerful and, and very essential in the context of capital markets. Um, it's, it's that customization to connect it with what those companies actually bring to their consumers, to connect it to their DNA. And to do that, it has to be customizable. Um, so the, the context of, around transparency and, and, and the, the scores. But on the other hand, you have ESG ratings, which in the process, there is subjectivity. There is an opinion built into the process of aggregation. And what that means is that it's hard to replicate. Or I would argue it's impossible to replicate. Um, and the expectations need to be set accordingly. Adjusting, customizing is not possible. Also, regulation is requiring um, financial professionals to put controls in place to ensure accuracy of the data, including scores and ratings. Um, and, and there is a very interesting uh, dialogue happening in financial markets in Europe right now of how do we do that as practitioners? How do we build those controls in place to, and to take responsibility from the data providers and be confident that we're using accurate data? It's problematic, and I think that what is possible and what is not possible varies depending on the type of assessment that is being used in the investment process. Um, the third component is, is around complexity, and we've spoken about the complexity uh, in the context of sustainability as a whole, and, and we're really trying to quantify and measure the world's problems and aggregate them in one number. That's a humongous task. Um, but when I talk about complexity, I actually talk about data complexity. Sustainable data, ESG data, is a big data challenge, where we are um, trying to map physical assets and the world to the actual sustainability risks at those assets, aggregate that data at an investable asset level, whether that's a corporate or um, a real estate asset or an infrastructure asset, and then there is another la layer of aggregation to a portfolio, a fund, an index, or an investment uh, portfolio. There is a lot of massive big data challenges along the way. And new data sets are emerging constantly. And because it's an infancy, uh, the, the industry we are in is in infancy stage, we have to make sure that we are uh, planning for the fact that there will be a lot of new data sets being created. And they will be uncovering very material and significant risks and impacts that we need to measure and quantify and incorporate into those assessments. So managing volatility and, and not changing methodologies, I don't think is on the cards in the near future. It, it will be with us, and we have to plan for it wisely in the context of capital markets. And I'll just throw the fourth idea very quickly, um, which is about um, um, 
Sorry, it slipped my mind, but I'm sure it's going to come in the were course you, were of you the going presentation. To, were you going to this was the bad news. <laughs> See, I'm very positive. I only focus on the good news. Well, I, I know that you did. I don't, I don't know what you're going to say for the bad news, but you did mention you, um, you, uh, the, sort of the distinction between scores and ratings for ESG. And I just thought it might be interesting to, to hear a bit about that, because certainly I have heard people suggest that perhaps one of the problems with ESG ratings is that in the early days, in order to give them credibility, um, people, the providers chose the term ratings, uh, but of course that has then attracted comparison with credit ratings, and obviously these are quite different things. And so I think scores is is a direction that people are moving in more now. Is that um, is that what is that sort of where you're going with that, or? Um in a way, I mean, I think there will be always a room for both types mm. of assessments in mm. capital markets, similar to how financial analysis uh, is conducted. You do have analyst opinions on financial performance, and you do ha have quant models. So I think that there is definitely room for both in, in the future. Um, but it's about understanding what you get. It's about transparency and communication. And I, I do believe that, again, uh, making the analogy with the financial analysis, uh, we're trying to potentially create too big of an aggregation. And what we see happening in the marketplace is, is a move away to actually the building blocks of that aggregation, more a scorecard type view that allows users to select the building blocks that align with their requirements, whether it's regulatory requirements, customer needs to create a new product, and take those building blocks to then incorporate them. There, the ambiguity and the uh, correlation challenges we spoke about are um, a, a lot less present. <laughs> um, Hakan, uh, it's a murder, sorry. Um, uh, so uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on, again, um, sort of where, where we are with ESG ratings now and, and where we need to get to? Well, thank you for the question, Lucy. In fact, ESG ratings are a necessity, right? Let, let's be very clear about this. We have set ourselves the goal of the European Green Deal. We want to get there. No management without measurement. You have to have those measures. So that's for, not for no reason that they're being used, but it's also a very complex challenge, and that's why it's not for no reason that there is so much criticism about it, about things that can be done better. And when I was asked this question, I thought, mm, what would be the two things I would like to see? Because as the European Investment Bank, we are being rated. We don't really use them that much because we do our own sustainability due diligence. We have the luxury of being able to do that. But we are being rated since the very, very early days. And we engage and we talk and we find out and we see the strengths and, well, the not so strong parts. There are two things which came to my mind. Well, basically, the first one was about the clarity of measurement. And the second one is about the transparency of the methodology. So the first one would be really clarity of measurement about what, what is being measured. And the second one about the transparency of the methodology, the how. Because that's exactly what we see. We, we are being rated very well, fine, but we say, and what does that mean? Are you actually aggregating our E, S, and G scores right into one, which is a very, let's say, courageous task to do, because it basically gives a weight to everyone, and it almost begs the question, if you up your S, you can lower your E, or the other way around, and I don't really think that feels right. It shouldn't be that way. Uh, so what is it that's being measured? If it's about materiality, then is it the financial materiality? But if so, what is it then, right? And some say, yeah, it's single materiality, it's financial materiality. But then tell me how much. And that's, of course, very hard to do. Others say it's double materiality. OK, so what's my impact materiality? Clarity of measurement, what exactly are we measuring? And if different rating agencies have different results, that might make well be because they're looking at different things and they are putting different values and weights. So please be clear about it and suddenly we will all feel much better and we will be able to use the data much better. And the second one, and that is about the how, you know, the transparency of methodology, because to be clear on the measurement, you have to say how you arrived there. 
And all too often, we see, oh, methodology has changed. We just had that example. So how did it change? Tell us. Um, we don't really always get that information. We would love to see maybe a public consultation before the methodology has changed. There are elements of that, but it's not standard practice. Be open about it. Be transparent on the methodology so that the user can actually understand what comes out of it. I think this is easy to do and would bring a huge benefit. Be transparent about the methodology. Be transparent about the timing. You know, how often are you updating the data? Um, shouldn't be difficult to do, and suddenly there would be a bigger value added. So I see really these two things, the clarity of measurement, transparency of methodology, would bring, bring us way forward. And I'm very, very positive about the future, because not only are we going to need it, we are going to have more data. And our colleagues from the European Commission are doing a fantastic job, in my humble view, by bringing us the European standards of sustainability reporting, because with that coming in place, you suddenly will start having the data to do your own analysis, a bit like you could do your own financial analysis. Now you can do your own sustainability analysis and look at your environmental, your sustainability or your government, uh, governance effects and do your own analysis. So I think we are moving forward. Data is becoming more available. I heard that. That's really positive. And suddenly, I think we will have more data, more quality, more transparency, and more understanding of what exactly have we measured, right? More clarity on measurement. So we will have more data, and we will manage it better. And that's why I think ESG data and ratings, time for a rethink. I would say it's not time for a rethink, but it's time for a leap forward. And I hope we're going to see that. Thank you. Well, Julian, last but very much not least, given that uh, you may be, uh, you, you possibly have more influence over the direction that this is all going in the, than anyone else here. Um, so ESMA has uh, undertaken a consultation on ESG ratings that um, closed last year. Uh, and I think initially it was about two years ago that ESMA asked for additional powers to regulate ESG data and ratings. Could you maybe just start by Say, uh, telling us sort of why, why you did that in the first place and then some of the takeaways from the consultation. Sure. Um, <clears throat> first of all, let me thank the organizers for um, setting up this smoothly running event and uh, for inviting me here. Um, so indeed, we had this uh, open letter to the European Commission a couple of years ago that called for legislative action uh, in the space of ESG ratings. Now, what was the rationale behind this? I think. This has uh, already been mentioned several times. I mean, we've seen a lot of growth in the sustainable finance space. Uh, ESG investing has really taken hold. And as part of that, um, ESG ratings are becoming increasingly um, pre prevalent. Basically, asset managers, investors more broadly are using ESG uh, ratings and integrating these in their investment process. Um, and of course, that means you know, uh, at, at some point, the uh, some of the issues that have been raised with uh, ESG ratings, including here on inconsistency, transparency, then become uh, increasingly problematic. So um, what ESMA was doing was uh, precisely to set out what, in our view, were some of the key components, basically, of what a regulatory framework for ESG ratings should look like. So there were three main building blocks to this proposal. The first one is to introduce um, basically a, a common legal framework, so um, common definition to understand what is an ESG rating. So just for example, uh, you know, should, should it be the case that a regulation would apply only to ratings? Should it be ratings and scores? What are the limits? What should be in scope exactly? This needs to be, of course, precisely um, defined and, and um, discussed. We're uh, of the view that a broad spectrum uh, would be preferable uh, in order to ensure that minimum standards and requirements apply to the market at large. Um, second building block, the uh, uh, setting up a registration and supervisory regime. Uh, we think there are good reasons uh, why this should, should, this should take place at EU level, and I'll touch on this on, on a second. That's, that was also one of the outcomes of the uh, fact-finding exercise we did last year. Um, now, ESMA is, is, in our view, relatively well-placed to take that responsibility because we have experience in uh, the supervision of credit rating agencies, even though, as you mentioned, these are different products. 
um, but you know, the, some of the, uh, for example, organizational requirements that uh, would apply to the rating providers are uh, in some way comparable to what exists in the context of credit rating agencies. Um, third building block, the product specific requirements. Um, so what ESMA is keen on is not to achieve full consistency of the ratings, but to improve the comparability of the ratings. This is, uh, in our view, one way to empower investors and, and specifically retail investors, which learn a lot and have a lot to gain from ESG ratings. That's, you know, the ESG ratings are a very useful way to uh, collect and crunch a lot of data and make it available in a very uh, easy way for less sophisticated investors. So, uh, you know, making sure that these investors are very well informed and in a position to compare the ratings is, in our view, paramount. Now, um, following this call for evidence, we conducted this uh, sort of fact-finding exercise. If you want to regulate a market, you have to understand a little bit what the market looks like concretely. Um, and there are maybe four main points. I don't want to take too long. I, I, I'll go very briefly over the uh, four points. Uh, first of all, we found that there were around 60 rating providers currently active in the market. Now again, you know, this is just uh, an estimate. It's based on responses from rating providers themselves, as well as users and rated entities. Uh, keeping in mind that <clears throat> what you call an ESG rating uh, may be very subjective. Even the rating providers themselves disagreed on whether uh, their products were ESG ratings or not. Um, second main finding, um, a lot of the rating providers are um, actually small EU SMEs. Um, there are a few very large non-EU groups uh, that tend to concentrate a lot of the market. I think Philip referred to that. Um, but there's also quite a, a broad diversity of, of rating providers, uh, even though they're uh, concentrated in a few jurisdictions within the European Union. Now, interestingly, uh, users uh, tend to subscribe to several providers at once. So why do they do this? Uh, what we found out was that uh, users uh, basically enjoy the fact of, of uh, uh, receiving different opinions, um, you know, some point to inconsistencies. I think that's it's also well established in the in the literature. Surprisingly, investors also told us, at least a number of them told us that they valued that diversity because it gave them different point of views, uh, depending on what you intend to measure. Measure, obviously, that goes back to the point of being very clear about what you measure and providing very clear definition and uh, transparent methodologies. Um, and indeed, quite a bit of uh, a concentration within a few large market players, but users of the ratings were hoping to increase coverage by using more than one provider and getting specialist views on a few specific topics. Last point, um, some of the shortcomings that were highlighted in the course of this, um, what we call call for evidence, um, where lack of coverage, this has been mentioned, insufficient data granularity, um, now, I think this has improved a little bit in the past 12 months, um, at least from my perspective. Uh, this is something we, we're keen on watching. And obviously, uh, given the uh, legislative pipelines, we can only uh, expect this to further improve in the future. Um, and finally, lack of transparency. I think that's a fundamental point. I can refer to that. Uh, that keeps coming back over and over. Transparency about data, choice of metrics, assumptions, methodologies. Uh, so where, what, what next? I think from, um, we heard from Martin Schwaltz earlier that the results of the consultation or that the next steps are going to be um, um, unveiled on the 13th of June. Um, I, I don't know if, what, what can, is there anything you can tell us about, about and what, what we can expect then? Uh, obviously, I'm not expecting you to, to, to jump the gun, but is there anything you can tell us about, uh, at least about the, the process that, uh, the, the, basically the next steps in this, in this process? Um, so I'm not in the, uh, in the shoes of the European Commission, so there's only uh, so much I can say about the, the upcoming regime itself. Um, now, from ESMA's side, what this entails, of course, is developing the so-called technical standards um, that um, you know, ESG rating providers that intend to provide ratings in the future um, will need to adhere to in order to be officially recognized by ESMA. So these are the, um, some registration requirements, uh, authorization, um, and so ESMA's um, main focus over the next 
um, months and, and um, possibly years is going to really harsh out the exact details of what it is that uh, rating providers need to demonstrate in order mm. to be authorized in the European Union. Mm. So, Philip, going back to the, uh, yeah, on, on the subject of the consultation. Now, I know that um, in the consultation, uh, the, everyone who, who uh, one of the questions was, would you support uh, intervention by the EU in the uh, ESG ratings and data space? Uh, and if so, would you prefer it to be um, actual uh, legislation or voluntary? And I think Reprisk said they would prefer a voluntary basis, as, as is happening at the moment in, in Japan. Can you tell us why you think that's important? Well, I'm a big fan of the European Union, but I'm a bit afraid it, it ends up like the taxonomy and SFDR, that, that it's, it's very prescriptive, right? And, and I think there's so much advancement in, in technology. Uh, a lot of the approaches that um, ESG rating providers have taken in the past, that they're really of the past. Um, so, so this is my fear, right? Um, and I really hope, if, again, if you look at IOSCO and the Code of Conduct for Japan, the, the key thing is conflict of interest and transparency, mm -hmm. right? And related to that, what is actually the, the, the purpose? So I think. I really hope that the regulator and supervisor enforces this uh, transparency. And I must say, this doesn't happen voluntarily, because we went radically transparent in September 2021, and not one single provider followed us. We have so-called Jupyter notebooks. You can actually go to our website and check everything out, how it works. We also now um, are, are completely transparent about the machine learning transforms we use. Um, and you have to enforce this transparency. That's my learning. I thought when, when, when we are the first, we, we put the others under pressure, but of course, obviously we don't. Maybe we're economically not, not important enough. So there must be uh, the supervisor and regulator mm -hmm. stepping in to, to enforce this uh, transparency. And I just want to mention one more thing from, from a regulatory and supervisory and practitioner point of, of, of view. One thing that must also stop, but, uh, apart from being non-transparent and not clear what the purpose is, is, is this backtesting. Many investors do backtesting with data points that are constantly changed, methodologically or, or backfilled. You cannot do a backtesting in VSG ratings. You can't. It's complete, sorry the word, rubbish. Mm. So please stop doing that, um, because we learned now that there's backfilling, there's changed methodology, a changing purpose. S some, some ratings went from a sustainability, whatever that means, to a sustainability risk. Again, what does that mean? So it's, you can't do that. That's another mm -hmm. point we, ha we haven't mentioned yet. Okay, well, we have, uh, we've mentioned a couple of times the perhaps some of the issues of combining E, S, and G into one rating, and that's something that's also been mentioned in, in a couple of, of questions here. Um, and I know there has been one of the things that was being talked about in terms of the uh, consultation and potential regulation was actually mandatory disaggregation of the three, so it, would, you know, it wouldn't be able to provide a single ESG rating. Um, Elena, do you think there is any virtue in, would there be any virtue in that approach? Um, probably not. I would be on the side of there is a lot of very valid use cases for an aggregated ESG view, hmm. provided that there is enough transparency and clarity as to what it actually <coughs> delivers. Hmm. Um, we also need to acknowledge that the industry is at different phases of maturity. There are some markets in the block that are very advanced, and from our experience, they don't work with uh, pre-coined ESG scores. They, build, they use raw data and they build their own view on sustainability. There are other markets in the context of the block and especially in the context of this conference that are just starting the journey now. They need the starting point. They need guidance. They need to know, great, there are hundreds of data points. There are lots of complex issues. We are financial professionals. How, how do we make sense out of the data? So they need those starting points. It's, it, it's, it's the first step on the journey. How quickly then provide, uh, practitioners move beyond that first step into building their own view on the world, it varies from, provider to, from, from practitioner to practitioner. So I think in the foreseeable future, there is definitely not only very valid uses, but a necessity to enable the industry to move in the direction that regulation, legislation is pushing the industry to go to. 
um, whether it's going to look different in five years, I, I, it probably yes. Mm -hmm. Probably it will look quite different. Mm -hmm. And again, from our experience, we see the movement towards more give me the components, give me the climate assessment and, and the ambition on the transition plans, give me the social risk profile of the company based on its supply chain and operations. So I, I believe this is the direction of travel, but until we make ESG scores obsolete, we're going to have to make them work for the industry. Uh, Katarina, um, uh, you were saying that you're welcoming some of the regulation on corporate reporting. What about regulation on ESG ratings and data? Do you think that that would be helpful and what sort of things would be most helpful from a corporate perspective? I think it would be helpful. I, I never thought I would lean in the direction of more regulation. But if you uh, look at the state of uh, the art as it is now, it's basically, um, and I said, it's, it's, a, it's a new market, right? And it's a very dynamic and competition between rating agencies and it is business, believe me, uh, is there. And the competition actually drives positive changes. We see new more like data analysts providing clear description of how they work with data. Um, some investors don't use just uh, ratings, they also look at the key KPIs. Mm. So um, the market forces are working, but I'm not sure if they're working fast enough, if we have enough time to wait for the market mature. And if there is legislation or regulation that just um, levels the playing field, and I don't think it needs to be robust or overly prescriptive, but you know, um, let's require good governance from ESG rating agencies. Uh, make your methodology crystal clear, make it public. Um, I understand there might be some proprietary uh, algorithms or, or some you know, internal mechanisms, but make sure that we know how you work with the data and what the process is. Uh, make sure we know how old the data is, hmm. because with some agencies it can go back to two years. It does not reflect the, uh, what the company does now. Um, whenever there is change in methodology, make sure that you recalculate the scores backwards so that if, when we look at historical trends and I go down in the rating, we can have situation when my company improves, but the rating goes down because methodology is stricter than five years ago. And I'm not against being stricter, that's perfectly fine, but if you look at the trends, they need to be comparable. And uh, also make your business model absolutely clear. Who pays you? And if you provide services, what does that mean to whom? And I think that that kind of framework would be really helpful and would help to increase transparency because, let's be honest, ESG ratings, um, they, they do have costs for us. It's access to capital and it's reputational risks. You know, it, it's, it, it, the real impact on business is there. So, so, so come out some kind of framework, I would definitely welcome it. Fantastic. Well, we have a question actually um, for Philip from Martin um, uh, saying, <laughs> how can supervisors enforce transparency of ESG rating providers if they currently have no powers to do so at the EU level? If they don't have the power to mm. do so. And I, as a Swiss, shall tell you how to do that. I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, so, so what is the question to me? I don't know well, how the European is, so Union uh, works. I, uh, I, suppose that's, I suppose that's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Martin, do you have a... Well, do you, Okay, I see. Uh. I have an idea. Let's do the Japanese way. Because basically this uh, code of conduct is voluntary, mm -hmm. but obviously if you, if you don't sign up to this code of conduct, I mean, something is wrong because it's about conflict of interest, transparency on the methodology, um, also that you have a mechanism to talk to companies, which is another big problem. I mean, if, if, if you endorse that, I don't know exactly who has endorsed that, the supervisor, the regulator, the legislator, then I'm sure that, that uh, this will certainly um, um, bring up the... Uh, the, the the level of a playing field. I agree that this is a model mm. that can work really well. We've mm. endorsed the Japanese uh, code of conduct as well. 
Okay, great. Well, another question. Um, again, you touched on this uh, um, in, in your introduction, Katerina, is the question about ESG scoring and risk analysis in uh, CE um, and some of the challenges of that. I know this isn't um, this isn't restricted to CE. It's also the case in a lot of other uh, regions that are not sort of Western Europe or, or the US. Um, and uh, how we obviously what part of the problem being limited corporate data part of the problem perhaps being uh, the size of some of the the corporates in the region i'm uh, i'm philip maybe have you got some thoughts on you now what um how this can be made a sort of more level playing field across regions can i have <laughs> an idea okay yeah, elena go for it <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> Maybe I'll, I'll just give you a, f a couple of facts to ground the problem. We process data on 14,000 companies, and to do that, it takes 700 analysts to ensure that the data is of a reasonable quality and comparability. So to go deep into emerging markets, simply it's not an economically viable model. Why does it take so much effort to process, and I talk about fundamental ESG data, I don't talk about other alternative data sets that, that the industry creates and generates. It's a, similar to how we process financial, let's process the basics, the fundamental ESG data that companies actually invest a lot of money to communicate and pub make it publicly available. The reason why it is such a costly and lengthy exercise is that the data today is voluntary and there is no agreement on reporting standards. There is no agreement on what is that fundamental global baseline for companies to, to measure, manage and report on. And they are bombarded by dozens and dozens of requests for different data sets. And most of the companies operate across jurisdictions, across regions, and they have to comply and meet the needs of all of those different reporting requirements. It's very costly for the companies. It's extremely costly for the data providers. So to me, the part of the solution is mandatory disclosure on agreed base standards and principles. And I think that that's where the work of the commission, with EFRAC, um, guide support uh, on ISSB, and I know there is a panel later today to talk about ISSB and what that means for the industry, from our perspective, is critical. It's really important to solve for the coverage challenges in smaller emerging regions and markets across the world. And if I, if I might add, another solution, of course, is you don't build your ESG rating space in company reporting, right? So, so basically, um, you, you base it on technology and see what type of uh, incidents are going on with companies, what business contact do they have, right? And then you don't have the coverage problem um, if, if you leverage this technology and look at, at information from, from outside of the companies. Mm. So you have, you have the coverage and you have the speed. So, so this were my answer, and I would limit the company reporting to carbon data and diversity, mm. that's it. So yeah, um, so uh, actually we haven't really got into that, but yes, obviously that, that is the, 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 for anyone who's not familiar, so familiar with that, there's basically two types of, um, or two methodologies for ESG ratings is either using company disclosed data or ex uh, data external to the company. Some people only do one or the other. Um, some rating agencies use a combination of both. Again, another dif dif um, differentiation in, in the methodologies. Um, uh, we, we have got to wrap up in a second, but Hakan, any thoughts from your, from your side um, on the CE question and ESG ratings? The, the CE question, as in how, how you make this a, a level playing field and the sort okay. of challenges yeah. for um, regions that are not Western Europe, say. Yeah. No, definitely. I, I, I think we come back to the basic problem of having the data for the ESG rating agencies, but also for everyone. And that's why it's so important that we do have the European Sustainability Reporting Standards and the European Single Access Point, where that data becomes available to everyone. So you do have your level playing field, at least for the EU 27, which is already a big, big step forward. 450 million people on this planet. That's a big step forward. And that enables this 
comparability going forward. So I'm really looking forward to that. That will be an excellent step. Fantastic. Um, well, we are, uh, we're out of time and it's lunchtime, so I won't keep you all any longer. I uh, just want to say thank you uh, very much to the panellists for a really interesting discussion. Thank you to all of you for listening and thank you again to Linda and Julian for uh, setting up this debate and, and this excellent conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy, for moderating as well. And as you already mentioned, uh, we are now slowly proceeding and progressing to the lunch break. So hopefully everyone is hungry. Please, you can, you can move out from the room to get some nice lunch. And thank you for this really interesting, insightful, and again, solutions-oriented discussion, which is exactly what we were hoping for. Thank you so much. <laughs>